I will hand it over to Mary Catherine and Laura. Hello, everybody. So we are going to go ahead and jump into things and get started. Um, our contact info on Instagram is on the main page. If you do not know me, I am Mary Catherine Daly, a speech therapist by trade. I'm Laura Hayes. I'm also a speech language pathologist by trade. And we do have our financial disclosures available here. We have listed our financial from AbleNet, and we both have private practices. And then non-financial, I do have my ASHA Cs and my ATP through Resna. And similarly, uh, as we mentioned, we have we are receiving honorarium for this, and we do receive consultation fees and course fees through our private practices. I'm also a member of ASHA. And so let's jump in. That's not the part you want to hear. You want to hear all about what we're going to learn today and some exciting ideas. The three takeaways very quickly is we want to be able to discuss these three tools to create a switch accessible experience on either a computer or tablet based format. Three ways to differentiate switches based off of size, pressure and activation. And then five ways, this is, you can tell I'm excited, five ways to use Google Slides to create switch accessible materials for learning and access to communication opportunities, such as reading, drawing, vocabulary, et cetera. So just so you know, too, we will be talking about AbleNet products um, since this is through AbleNet, but there are lots of products out there. So just know that these ideas can be used with alternative access hardware. And as I've mentioned to some of the people that I support, it can be really utilized for anyone who you're engaging with communication in. So just kind of take the tips and adapt them as you see fit. We are curious uh, of you guys out there today, who has, and you could just do a quick jump in the um, chat and let us know uh, who's used a computer switch interface before. Lots of yeses, great. Okay, who knows? A long time ago. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> Fortunately, not yet. Okay, so I feel like maybe we'll just go over it um, and, you know, we can, if you, if it's, it'll be a little bit of a review, if not, um, that's okay too. Okay, so, you know, like Laura said, before we get into the really fun stuff and the Google Slides, I wanted to make sure I painted an entire picture from the physical modification um, all the way up to the tech modifications and using Google Slides. So I wanted to go over just some switch types today. Um, if you do not already work with your PT and OT, those are really strong team members that look at the alternative access piece and physical access. So the two different types of switches that I most commonly see with the 37 different districts that I go in and out of it are the mechanical switches. So those are going to be, you know, your buddy buttons, your jelly bean twist. Um, over here, you see this little cup switch. So it's just a teeny tiny switch that fits in the palm or a wobble. Most often we see wobbles at the head. Now a mechanical switch, you have to physically activate to press. So you kind of have to start to think about that if you're starting from ground zero with a client, maybe a client or student is new at the beginning of the school year, um, where are we going to be activating what part of the body, the switch, and then we can start to talk about what about the switch type, the size, we're gonna talk about pressure in a moment, a second type of switch is an electrical switch. So the most common electrical switch I see around school districts is the candy corn. And this is a really cool switch because it works by proximity, meaning that a student doesn't have to physically touch the switch to activate it. So I was talking to somebody the other day and just as an example, they were talking about their student does best laying on their back and rolling a little bit. And so I said, oh, maybe you should think about a proximity switch, you know, because sometimes if you roll too much, don't roll far enough, 
they might not be able to physically get to the switch to touch, but maybe an electrical switch where they can just get close enough to activate it. So uh, again, working as a team on a collaborative approach is best. Um, so there's a lot of different switches out there. And I think the first step on this journey is to figure out where you are going to place that switch on the body and then looking at um, some of these more commonly used switches. Another type of figuring out switch um, type, for lack of a better word, is the pressure. And so like I had just talked about is that proximity switch, you don't need to physically touch it to place pressure on the switch to activate. Um, versus a micro light from AbleNet, it's about the size of two quarters and you just need the most um, the lightest touch to activate that switch, 11.3 grams. And if anybody's ever used a micro light, you know how uh, light touch it is. And then you go on to the jelly bean um, twist, I believe this is, and it's 156 grams. Um, a pillow switch is 180 grams. And I, I love to um, put in a doorbell, like a classic doorbell, like we grew up with in the 80s and 90s because a, a doorbell, utilizes 453 grams of pressure to activate. So just kind of think about like the last time you've activated a doorbell and how you probably, number one, didn't even have to think about it um, to activate and, and how much of a pressure that difference that is from a micro light. And this can really come into play with fatigue and thinking about, you know, not only the placement, but how um, is that repetitive nature of activating the switch going to work? for my students. So again, we could spend all day talking about switches, but I think the point of this is just kind of giving you the groundwork of the, of the mechanics and the, the physical aspects to then set up the, uh, the tech side of it. Another really important part is positioning your switch. So maybe you found the switch type you want. Maybe you know exactly where that location is or multiple locations on the body your switches are going to go. Um, and you need to think about positioning because if a switch becomes out of alignment, even the slightest to the left, to the right, up and down, uh, our students and clients might not be able to activate that switch anymore. So you could have created the coolest thing in Google Slides, but if they can't access it, um, but, you know, what is, what's the point of it? So um, two different types of mounting that I really like are number one, the modular hose on the right. So I was talking to my OT about modular hose and, you know, as a speech therapist, I was like, this is great. I love modular hose. Um, and I want to talk about the pros and cons of both because she kind of opened my eyes a little bit. Um, so modular hose is really great. You can see there's a different clamp options down here. The lock line bends and twists. And I, I really find it to be a strength when we're first kind of playing with location on the body and where are we going to put the switch? Cause I can just tweak it the slightest bit or maybe I can move it from an armrest down to a foot plate or something on a wheelchair. Um, I would say, and, and it's also really great because if our student transitions from a wheelchair to a beanbag chair, well, now I can put it on the bookshelf right, and clamp it on the bookshelf so they can have access to a toy, a device. Um, one, I think, not necessarily negative, but something, consideration is that um, the lock line is great, but you couldn't put something like a step-by-step -step on it because it would be too heavy. It might pull it down. Um, and also, it can easily become out of alignment or position. Um, it's not something that is as permanent as something over here on the left, like a universal switch mount. So a universal switch mount, you can see it is a lot more rigid. Um, you can really lock it into place with the joints. And this is something that I would see more often um, where a student is always going to be in a, a similar position, like in a wheelchair. Again, talk to your um, OTs and your PTs. This is coming from the perspective of a speech and language pathologist, but mounting is very important. I'm, you know, I know I've shown up to consults and I've forgotten a mount and I'm like holding the switch at the head or wherever it is. And I'm like, did they activate it or did my hand move? And, you know, um, I activated it for them. So I think the positioning is extremely important too. We have links for all the items we are talking about at the end of the presentation. 
All right, so now we're going to talk about how do you make Google Slides switch accessible? And it's not really as complicated as probably most people think. Um, but how do you make Google Slides switch accessible? You do that through a computer switch interface. So today we're just going to be talking about the hitch. Um, like Laura said, there are other computer switch interfaces out there, um, but think about a computer switch interface like a telephone. And we want our switch to communicate with our computer or our iPad. And how is it going to do that? It's going to do that through the computer switch interface. Because what a switch do, what a switch does is it assigns a keyboard a keyboard function function ah, to activate. So for example, very common keyboard functions that are used are space, enter, right, left. So what that switch does is it assigns a keyboard function. And this computer switch interface, if you've used one before, it has things like left click, right click, enter, space. Um, so it's communicating, it's the in-between. And so if you think about running a Google slide show, think about how you advance your slides, just you yourself. You use enter, you could use a left click on your mouse. Um, you could use space, the space bar advances to the next slide and the right arrow also advances uh, to the next slide. If you are using two switches, Okay, your computer switch interface would allow a right click and a left click or back. So you could move your slides forward and backward. And that's exactly what our computer switch interface is going to do for us. It's just going to assign that keyboard function. So the switch then is activated and the computer knows what to do. So who could benefit from a computer switch inter interface? I think Laura actually did this slide and summed it up very well. Anybody experiencing temporary injury or just a condition, a disability that limits their ability to use a standard computer um, input device. So maybe it is students with cerebral palsy, maybe it's students with decreased fine motor and using a mouse is a little bit more tricky or difficult, arthritis. Um, paralysis, MS. Um, we're going to be talking about building a playlist, and I think all ages and generations love music. Okay, so what do you need to start this process? You will either need for today's presentation, well, not necessarily today, but for what we are presenting on, a computer or an iPad. For um, Let's see, for some of our Google slide decks and the examples we're showing you, you will also need the internet. So just consider that. All right, so let's first just do some basic equations telling you what you will need. We also have a very nice organized chart, but if you are using a computer, you will need a computer switch interface, which has a USB plug on the end, you will also need a switch. And so I'm going to give you this video example of how to connect the computer switch interface. Set up a switch interface for the computer. The first thing you'll need to do is get your computer switch interface and plug the USB drive into your computer. Make sure it works, the light should be flashing. Then select your mode. We want the right arrow. So we are going to click through until we get to the yellow mode and then plug our switch in on the column of the right arrow. Then test your switch to make sure it works. Repeat for another switch function. So really you plug your switch interface in, the light tells you it's working, and then it's kind of like um, Battleship where you're like, okay, what row and column do I need to get to my function? So what do you need if you are using an iPad? And again, we are just using the hitch. You can use the hitch with an iPad, but an iPad is not USB accessible. So most often what I do is I order a dongle. So the dongle plugs into the iPad 
and then provides USB accessibility. Now, in, in my opinion, in my practice, I think using a computer switch interface with the computer is most seamless because as you add more parts and pieces, um, there's just kind of more transitions that need to happen, but it, it does still work. So I'm going to show you a video of this on an iPad. Plug in a switch interface to your iPad. First, grab your iPad and grab a dongle so it becomes USB accessible. Then take your switch interface and plug in the USB. The light should flash, so make sure it works. Then next, you're going to find the row for your mode. We will need a right arrow. Then find the column for the right arrow and plug in your switch. Repeat the steps for the other keyboard functions and test to make sure it works. So again, the same thing you're doing with your computer you're doing with your iPad. You just need that accessibility. Plug in a All right. A third way and product that you could use from AbleNet is the Blue 2 um, FT. Now, the video I'm showing is the previous Blue 2, but a lot of people like this option because it is wireless. Now, I have not, um, I rarely just use the Blue 2 as a switch for my iPad. Usually I use my Blue 2 and it has two different ports where you can plug in hardwired switches. So maybe I have a student and they need that really light touch switch at a certain angle at their head or with their thumb. And the Blue 2 switch won't really help for that activation and that placement. Well, now I can use Blue 2, connect it via Bluetooth to my iPad, which kind of frees up some wires, and then plug in my hardwired switch. So um, I'm going to go ahead and show you a video of how this works. Here's one way to plug in a hardwired switch into your iPad. So first grab a blue two and your hardwired switch. Make sure the blue two is turned on and then connect to your Bluetooth devices. Plug in your hardwired switch and make sure all the scanning options are set up on your iPad. You will also want to make sure the mode on the Bluetooth is the same as the switch input on the device. Make sure to turn off when you're finished to save battery. So this is a really quick video, again, just kind of showing you the possibility and the setup. Um, where you don't have to use a computer switch interface. If you go to your loan closet, if you go to your school district um, center and they have a Bluetooth um, FT or the previous version, you can use hardwired switches. Here's one. And you can hear the sound. I've recorded the other videos in summer and this, the previous video was in the winter. So you can almost hear the congestion. All right. <laughs> so. Um, this is a chart we wanted to share with you um, of just some different switch interfaces and the capability. So, for example, Bluetooth. Can you use a Bluetooth with a computer? Absolutely, but you need to go over to these notes and read. The computer must have Bluetooth capability. Okay. Hey, can you use a, a pitch with an iPad, absolutely, but you're going to need that dongle and that hard wild, hardwired switch for iPad use. So just kind of showing you some different options. Everything pretty much works with a computer and an iPad. You just need to make sure you have that right combination of accessories. All right, so we are going to go ahead and now dive into some of the fun stuff. Hopefully we've given you um, some background on the physical modifications and the mechanics. And now we're going to be talking about the tech side. So I'm going to let Laura take it over. Um, one other thing we wanted to mention, Laura and I are in two different uh, states. We are both using remote access. So if it is a little bit delayed, that is the reason why. So Laura, do you wanna go ahead? Sure do. So one thing that we, potentially alluded to a little while ago was um, how it might be a little more seamless. You might have a little less tech issues if you are using a computer itself versus a tablet. Uh, 
So one of the tricks of the trade, if you are going to use an iPad, is to actually just download Google Slides or the PowerPoint app. It's a little more seamless if you do it that way. So it's a trick of the trade. One of the things that we've done an entire different presentation on this is I think that we get hung up on the idea of like, well, we're going to hit the switch. And really, when we go into these activities, you're going to see it's not about hitting the switch. It's about creating these motivating, uh, customized resources and supports that are going to motivate them to engage in the, both what you're doing and communicate about it. So these five things that we're going to talk about are all things that you can create, you can customize, and are going to be accessible for who you're working with. The first is creating a storybook. It sounds so simple. I know all 270 of you at some point have either read a book or created a book with someone that you work with, right? This, what we're going to do today is show you an example using, and we're gonna show you for each one of these, what tools we use to create them. All of these are going to be free or accessible to you in some capacity. So I'm hoping most of you know, as educators, you have free access and a limited support within Canva. Does everyone know that? If not, you need to go and you need to look at it right now. You need to sign up. You need to get um, certified so that you can have access to that so that you can create supports. It's an amazing resource. Uh, oh, and yes, also nonprofits uh, do get Canva too. Yes, thank you, Emily. Because... There's some great, uh, Lauren Enders, Sager Gregory, um, to name a few, have done some really great presentations all about the possibilities for Canva. So for this example, we're going to show you how we created this fun, interactive storybook that you can read with Canva and Google Slides. So I'll walk you through it, and then I'll show you kind of how we did it. But if we titled it The Wild Zoo in the Google Slide itself, we're going to copy and paste this photo from Canva. And then, uh, Mary Catherine, you just used an editing software for Turn the Page, right? Or did you create that in Canva too? Uh, I just used Google Slides for that, yes. Okay. So you can also make these head pointing accessible, but we'll talk about that later. So, yeah. And so, um, note too that there's some videos on there if you wanted to even integrate editing software with simple supports to match a communication system, you can do that in here too. Mm -hmm. We, so we did the wild zoo. Welcome to the wild zoo. There is a giraffe blowing bubbles looking at you. So it looks pretty integrated, right? It looks like we found this picture of a giraffe blowing bubbles and how clever, how cute. If we go to the next one. Welcome to the wild zoo. You guys like this repeated line? There is a <laughs> lion playing the xylophone looking at you. Looks pretty innovative, right? Looks pretty integrated, I mean. Uh, welcome to the wild zoo. There is a hippo eating a cupcake looking at you. These are not integrated. These are ones that we have combined in Canva to make it more engaging, make it more custom, make it more fun, make it a little more silly. Um, this lovely meerkat is jumping on a trampoline looking at you. These are things that you could either create ahead of time or you can create on the fly with someone that you're working with to make it silly, to make it fun. Welcome to the wild zoo. And there's an elephant coloring looking at you. And the day is done at this crazy zoo. I'm thinking that zebra is living the, the best life. What funny things animals do, okay? And then we can close the book. So we're, we're accessing Google Slides using our accessible supports and our switches, and then we're engaging them by using these creative options within Canva. So there, thanks, Mary Catherine. Okay, so now all I can see, hold on. Um, Here we go. My, there we go. Yep, hit the wild. Yep, One more sorry. over. It's, it's. I'm we're blocking it. That's what's tricky right now. Hold on. There you go. Okay. One more I got over. It. Sorry. Is it this one? I can't see because we're blocking. There you it. go. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here you can see in Canva itself, uh, we just utilized the support here. And then there's our wild zoo. And then again, you can overlay these photos by using different images, and then you can put the text there, or you can put the text in Google Slides, whatever your preference is there. But let's say if we're under elements and we want to create a new one, 
Um, Go down to generate your own. Oh yeah, hold on. Right, yeah. yeah. Right, yep, and then enter it's... the five words. Yep, right there, yeah, do that way. Okay, and so this is just an AI feature that, that helps us create them quickly. So um, why don't someone put in the chat, give me an idea of something you would like at your wild zoo. I will read it. Well, I don't know if I can read it. Hey, can you call it out? Um, oh, I can see it. I can see it. Wait, oh, you can see it. Okay. Oh, a lizard's you... chewing gum. I like that. Oh, oh no, I a like monkey that. eating cotton. Which one? Monkey eating cotton. I think let's do monkey eating cotton candy. Oh, these are all so good. Mm -hmm. Creative people today. Everyone's drank their coffee. Monkey eating. And while Laura does that, um, you. Uh, I didn't know how to get a free account as an educator, free premium. So I just Googled it and there was a link. So just FYI. Oh, how cute. Oh, what do we like? I mean, these are all great. <laughs> all of these are great. I'm just going to grab the first one. So I just pull it in here. And then we can add our text and we can keep going. So it's a very simple, very, very fast tool. And I like that it's real life too for older students and individuals. Yeah, real photographs, exactly. One thing I did learn, I was teaching a course and I learned this, if you hit the three dots, like if you know the picture you chose, the three dots um, over on the left-hand side, Laura under magic media, yeah right there, it says generate more like this. So if you liked that one, but it wasn't just quite what you were looking for, you can take that specific one and have it generate more. And you can also see too, you've got images, graphics, and videos. So like those are all at your fingertips. So like a good example of this would be like if you were doing a social story and you were talking about like classroom or school expectations and you wanted to kind of integrate it all, um, you could put in that text and that AI would generate some different videos for you very, very quickly. And as far as I know, you can download these into PowerPoint, but not Google Slides from, from what I have um, experimented with. So just um, if you do have both Google Slides and PowerPoint, you can create your content and then you don't even have to like copy and paste over. But um, okay. Um, it's being a little slow and laggy, but you guys kind of think get the general idea of this, I'll right? Go, Laura. Thanks. <laughs> so, welcome. and then in each one of these, we just want to highlight. So again, we've mentioned this at the forefront, but when we think about like, we've created our fun activity, right. And we've saved time by doing it through Canva and using AI and all these great things. And so we just want to highlight the communication opportunities that we're now going to create in addition to all these communicative functions, like. Uh, requesting, protesting, uh, terminating, commenting, sharing opinions about things. Uh, we have just some examples. Obviously, you guys could very quickly generate some additional ideas on this. And then the next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. This is what I'll let you when, control. There you go. That's, that's, what, that's what happens when we're both going. Um, and, then, and then additionally, depending upon goes outside the scope of this presentation, but I'm sure you guys have all heard the terms analytic and Gestalt language processing, but we wanted to give you a few ideas around that as well. So if you're doing some core vocabulary work, um, we gave you some examples here. And then if you were looking at an early language Gestalt language processor, we gave you some potential Gestalts that you could consider for this activity as well. So um, just know that you can customize it for language needs as well as access needs. Other ideas that you could use this in similar capacities, consider personalized stories, right? I kind of mentioned that earlier within social stories, but you can do, I have so many like young adults, as Mary Catherine said, who love seeing themselves in the story, like give them something about them, you know, their little egocentric minds love it. I mean, we all kind of do like put me in the story, right? Let's make a story about a, like, and use green screen. Like let's use it to talk about like where we're going, what we want to do, what's our dream vacation, put us in the story. Book reports, right? If we're doing a book report about history, how can we create that within Canva and then put it in so it's 
accessible in Google Slides so we can present it to the class. Um, an entire class book based on theme, a numbers book or a letters book. Uh, I mentioned social story, a joke book. This one is so motivating, so, so motivating. Um, or just a scrapbook in of itself, like a memoir book throughout the year. That can be, don't underestimate the power of combining writing and reading within these Google Slides to then send home a representation of written expression to parents. Parents are astounded when they see something like, my kid did this. And it's like, yes, like we worked together. This is something that they created on their own. And just remember too, we, the benefits of personal stories. The research tells us there's increased engagement. There's improved comprehension with context and understanding. There's enhanced self-esteem and inclusion and representation with this. There's increased motivation. There's increased cultural relevance when we do this and tailored learning or creating opportunities for stimulation and motivation. Okay, so I'm going to take over. And again, all you need is your computer switch interface and one activation of the switch turns the page, right? So we're not hitting the switch, we are turning the page. So, all right, number two, we are going to create a flip book in art. So um, the tools I used to create this work Canva, it was really easy. It literally took me, um, when you guys probably got the handouts, you saw that there were 144 slides and you were like, yeah, in your dreams, you're getting through this in an hour. But um, you'll see that the flip book took quite a bit of the slide count because every single slide just moved the character an inch um, this way or that way. Um, so I used Canva. Google Slides, of course, and then Pixabay. So we're going to talk to you guys about Pixabay. So I'm going to first go through the flip book as if I were activating the switch. I'm going to um, just know that you can increase the amount of slides or decrease the amount of slides depending on your students' uh, like activation capability and repetitive nature. So um, this is what it's going to look like in the end. I created this for actually a middle schooler who loved uh, Curious George and football. And we were kind of working on eye gaze access and switch access. So I was like, well, let's, let's just kind of give him some um, practice um, and create an art project. So, so here we go. The sun is shining. And here comes George. There's supposed to be a sound. Oh, and here comes the football. The crowd was supposed to be cheering. And here comes Mr. Burrow. All right, so by activating the switch, it advances each slide and it kind of moves the story along. So I'm going to show you how I did this. So if you go into Canva, what I did was I created, I think I just picked like an Instagram um, square post. And I said, let me just delete this a minute. And I just, for example, went to elements and I did sun. All right, so I have the sun here but I don't want the sun shining right away because I need the sun to move into the frame. So what I did was I just said, oh, I'm gonna copy my page and I'm gonna move the sun an inch or whatever it might be. I'm gonna copy my page. I'm gonna add, uh, move the sun another half inch. Copy my page. Uh, I'm gonna move the sun. Copy my page. I'm gonna move the sun one more time. And then all of a sudden I said, I need the grass to grow. So I went to grass. And I put the grass in there. But as you know, I didn't want the grass growing in available right away. So I just moved it down. What do I do? I just duplicate it again and I moved the grass up. And then I duplicate it again and I moved the grass up. And I did this until I had my son and my scene and then Curious George. Um, 
And I actually, what I ended up doing was um, just downloading this, I believe into PowerPoint and it was ready to go. You know, nothing was physically moving on the page. It was like a flip book where you hold it and you turn the pages really quickly. Um, again, I think this one had a total of, uh, let's see, like over 60, you can make it a lot more simple. So maybe there's only 10 for your student. Maybe there's only five, maybe there's 20. But I thought it was just a really cool, unique opportunity um, to do something in art class. If you visit pixabay.com, this is an entire royalty-free website. So the sounds in there, I think because I did it on one computer and I transferred it to another, I didn't transfer the sounds. But it's really nice because you can go to uh, sound effects. And I did, for example, crowd cheering. So when Joe Burrow of the Cincinnati Bengals came in, you can see I can download and insert a sound. So let me do crowd cheering here. So all I would have to do is just download. It goes into my downloads and then I can just upload it into my PowerPoint. So we're gonna go back to our PowerPoint. Mary Catherine, we had somebody ask, is there a way to get pictures in from Canva to Google Slides? I think you talked about this a little bit earlier. I have not, see, well, let's just look really fast. I have not seen that opportunity, Laura. Um, like you said, Sarah Gregory would be a great one to ask. So I'm going to do share. I'm going to do, let's see, download. Sorry, let me move this. So yeah, they won't let you, from what I know, because they are licensed in Can Canva um, photographs and supports, you can't just like directly copy something. You would either oh. have to, download it or you I think that's the question right like or you would have to use your snipping tool but again you got to be careful because the images that you're using in here um, unless you're uploading them are copyrighted to Canva. It does say you could use Google Drive um, or Microsoft PowerPoint. I think what I ended up doing was downloading it in PowerPoint and then uploading it to my Google Drive, which then turned it into a Google Slides. Would that be yes. correct? That's what I do. Okay. So it's kind of a workaround, but you're right. Like you wouldn't want for a, a even a 20 page flip book, you won't want to like copy and paste every single one. So what I do is I download to a Microsoft PowerPoint and then... Um, or I wonder too, if you could just upload to your Google Drive and then when you click open, open options, if it would let you open in slides. So that's something yes. we can explore yeah. and we can get back to you with. I'll write that down. And Great. sometimes, and it like, there's, oh, go ahead. Is, is it, it looks like Becky put some written instructions in the Q&A as well. So um, oh, thank you. Off as well. Yes. Thank okay. You, yes. Thank you. That's super helpful, Becky. I will say one of the other reasons why I download it is because there many districts have permission issues directly giving access to Canva within Google Drive. Like there's a firewall in some mm. districts. So if you see that, just know that that is another reason to do the workaround. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, Laura did a very nice job of putting all these communication opportunities in here for art class and the flip book. Um, she did, of course, the core words and some of the gestalts and other ways to use. Um, maybe you're teaching a younger class how to draw click by click. Maybe you're creating a short film in a movie class. Maybe you're creating a social story or a puppet show, what, whatever it might be. Um, but putting those slides back to back kind of creates a movie and that's what we wanted to show. All right, moving on. Okay, one quick, I can quickly answer this one. So Jillian oh, yeah. asked, how, can you say how you got the sound effect in the slide again from Pixie? Oh, yeah. So you're gonna download the sound effect. Highly recommend doing the shortest one again, because you're gonna wanna save um, save the sound effect and you want to keep the memory low. So save your sound effect and then you're going to upload that sound effect to Google Drive. And um, then you're going to insert yeah. 
So you, go ahead. Yep. You're going to insert audio. Audio. And I usually just go like most recent, or you can like put it in a drive if you want to. Um, but here's just a recording. Let me just do a different recording. Clock sound. So um, when, yes. So then you can see it even pops up options. Like, do you want this to play automatically? And for our Switch users, I always say play sound and video automatically because you do not want them to have to do more clicks than what are needed, in my opinion. So now, um, if you don't mind this clock sound, Laura, is, and you can hide this little icon when you're presenting. So I go to my slideshow now, and when I, I hope everybody heard that, it was kind of quick. There you go, it's looping. All right, good question. Sorry to interrupt, Laura. I figured it's easiest just to show. No problem. Okay. So uh, similarly, we're going to talk about science vocabulary cards. And this is really, we, we gave the example for science, but you could do this for any academic vocabulary cards. And this is one that I love to meet teachers where they're at, or, you know, maybe even some of the specials classes where we're talking about vocabulary in, of itself. And you're like, we need to be doing core descriptive vocabulary. And they're like, but I have all this vocabulary that the academic vocabulary that I really need them to understand and to meet. So this is a nice happy medium of how we can kind of integrate the two. So for this, we use the tools, uh, Google Slides and Pixabay again. And we are just giving you the example of seventh grade science vocabulary. No, you can do it for pretty much anything. DNA is a self-replicating material that is present in nearly all living organisms as the main constituent of chromosomes. It is the carrier of genetic information. Okay, so it's like a dynamic flashcard. Okay, so if someone says we need them to understand DNA, what I can then do is use these two tools, I'm gonna to show you in a second, to give a description with an audio description, but also give the video of what it could be. So um, can you, I can't see your tabs again. Oh, you wanna get out real fast? Yeah, I was just gonna show very quickly. Yeah. So in Pixabay, I can look, we mentioned sound effects, but we also have images uh, and videos. So I can go and GIFs. There's a, there's so much in Pixabay if you haven't looked at it yet. Let's but do I a pediatric can... example. Sure. I don't know. What are you thinking? Um, Anybody have something strong that they want to, they want to search for one of their classrooms? Look in the chat. Music, yes, okay. Oh, perfect. So what would be a definition of music? Let's say, okay. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Laura. That's okay. Uh... I forgot we're both presenting. Okay. Oh gosh, what's an academic thing they talk about in music? Like the, key, the keys on a piano? Musical instruments. Perfect. Thank you. I need another cup of coffee today. Okay. So under my royalty free, I can go here. Um, Mary Catherine, are you able to get rid of the chat window? Yes. I can't, if it's you not letting let me. go of the mouse a moment, yes. I think I'll be able to. I am so sorry, you all. We are. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So you can see playing a piano. I can download this video right here highly recommend you again download the smallest bite size because it's gonna you're gonna then re-upload it to your google drive so then you can just simply insert it into your google slides and then it's being too slow and we're running out of time so i'm just going to i think everybody understands how to download and upload so you're going to do that and then just like we talked about earlier, we're going to upload an MP3 file. The easiest and fastest way to do that is on your computer, you have a sound recorder. All Pretty much all laptops have them in some capacity. So thanks, Mary Catherine. Mm -hmm. So you've got your sound recorder. 
you can look up a definition or you can make it as simple and differentiate it as you need to, right? Like a piano is a kind of instrument. Um, we play the piano. We can do a lot of different things. We can use core vocabulary. We can use descriptive vocabulary, differentiate it to the level that you need to, and then record it. Make sure under your settings, so there's those three dots. Um, can you click on those three dots, Mary Catherine? Yes. You'll see under in your setting, yes. Yep. You'll see in your settings, it will default to MP4. Google Slides doesn't like MP4. So you're going to change this to recording format, Mary Catherine. Mm -hmm. You're going to change that to MP3. That's just going to make your life so much easier. So then you're going to record an MP3, upload it to Google Drive, and then you're going to go, right, just like we showed you earlier, insert audio, and you're just going to insert whatever you just use as your definition. So like I did for DNA. Okay. Any questions? Does that make sense? And so um, we just gave you some examples. You could do that for an ecosystem, for talking about animals in the ocean, talking about... DNA is a self-replicating material. We An ecosystem is a biological community of interacting organisms. Um, again, hypothesis, he's thinking, an herbivore. Did you guys get the idea? Carnivore. And again, we have our language uh, functions here that we can talk about as well as some or and potential gestalts that you guys can reference. Okay. okay. So I, I think the vocabulary cards are very similar to the core word video slides that I created a few months ago. So um, these are all of the core vocabulary word books. There might even be more that are on my website. I'm happy to put a link before anybody leaves. Um, but the reason for creating these key core word slides are just, I wanted to have an interactive experience where switch users or all students um, could learn core words through multiple contexts and videos. And I think we've probably all had a student in the past that is a visual learner, or I know just a lot of my autistic preschoolers, they are so drawn to videos. A lot of them are drawn to videos. Um, so I wanted to provide a more interactive way. Um, I think number one for switch users and for users with alternative access to, um, be incorporated in their their curriculum. So I wanted to show you um, I. I used Pixabay like Laura had just talked about um, for the videos. Not all videos have sound in them. That's the best part. You know, you can have sound. You could be the sound talking through the video as well. Um, but these are built for you. This is exactly what they look like. Again, with your computer switch interface, it is a switch activation to turn the page, to um, read a book, to play a video. So um, I can smile. I can sleep at night. I ride my scooter. I swim in the ocean. I play with toys. And like Laura said before, if you guys use a specific um, language system or if your student with Switch Access uses a specific language system, you can put that uh, symbol onto the slides. You can download these slides for free. That's my favorite one. So you can edit them as you need them. They're on my website there. Um, and again, there's probably over 20 core word books now. Laura did a great job with these communication opportunities here. Um, the vocabulary, and uh, 
you can do whatever you need to to personalize them. Maybe it's a core word book about a student or experience um, that you have all had in your class. But again, that computer switch interface and that space enter tool is so powerful. Okay. And last but not least, um, someone just asked us in the chat. So this is just a lovely segue into how we can create a playlist. And that is going to encompass Google Slides, YouTube, and a sound recording. So Marley is our example here. Is this actually her list, uh, Mary Catherine? It is not. We do not listen okay. to country. <laughs> but I, but I was trying know. to find, it was either this or kids bop, and I picked country. So Okay. So, um, in a, so Marley is Mary Catherine's daughter, but we, if we're, if this could apply to anybody in any genre. Um, I will put a little caveat in there. Uh, you know, if you have somebody that likes something, uh, YouTube is, you have to um, vet it first. Like don't, you know, uh -huh. especially if you're getting into some, some of the songs now, you know, you guys know this. Okay. So for this example, though, we've got Tim McGraw, Keith Urban, Taylor Swift, the chicks. You can integrate this as much as you want to within writing, um, access to alternative keyboards, creating the playlist of, and of itself. But let's say you've now generated your list. You know that you're going to create a country playlist. Now we're going to be able to insert that playlist in here so that we can engage and communicate and just enjoy the music about it. So to do this, I want to do this quickly because I want to get yep. to yep. questions. Um, we can go into insert and then video. And then I'm going to be able to search YouTube. One little trick of the trade that you guys may already know is that if you don't want to see the ads within a YouTube video, you can actually put a dash. So you can look at it, but then you can put a dash in, in your URL between the, the T and the U. So it's Y-O-U-T dash U-B-E. And um, that eliminates the ads. So that's kind of a little hack for you guys. But let's look up Tim McGraw. You can see here's all of our videos that we have access to, right? So we picked Live Like You Were Dying, but you can pick any of them. And then you just click insert, and now you have your playlist here. You can resize it. Again, you could add any other uh, supports that you feel like are needed on that slide. But uh, as Mary Catherine mentioned, we're going to play it automatically to reduce that demand for our switch accept switch user. Um, okay, two minutes. So we did that with four videos so you could see. Mm -hmm. And then I'll jump down here so you can, I think we kind of touched on this already, right? Yeah, we did. Just making sure you play it automatically versus manually. And then there was like start time. So like, I always think about that music video thriller. Um, and how like the first five minutes are like talking and acting. So you can set the video to a very specific part or scene. And I always think about this for um, our Gestalt language processors or just for students who love like certain lines and videos or TV shows. You can do that too. It doesn't have to be a music playlist. It can be a movie or a TV show playlist. And you could do that for multiple slides. So like if you wanted to do that same video, but you wanted to have different parts that you're not, because we know that sometimes um, individuals can get upset if you stop something. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people use Tar Heel gameplay, right? And Tar Heel Reader, because it stops it naturally because it's already a function of it. So you can still do that in Google Slides. You would just go on the format like we just had open and you would choose the selection for that slide. And then on the next slide, you would choose the next part of the video. So if you stopped it at like 333, yeah. then the next video you would start it at 333. Thank you. Laura, we had somebody ask if, does the playlist require a user to use two switches? So do you want me to grab that, Laura? Yeah, you can grab it. Okay. So no, the playlist does not require the user to use two switches. One switch advances. Um, if the user is using two switches, it wants to go back. In Google Slides, even if it says play automatically, I have not had success 
getting the video if we're going back to another song to play automatically, if that makes sense. Like it only plays automatically when you move forward. But I do have a hack for that in PowerPoint. So very good question. You can use two slides. It just doesn't do a lot for you in Google Slides that I've, um, you can use two switches. It just doesn't do a lot for you in Google Slides. So we have kind of like a compare contrast PowerPoint versus Google Slides for you. Other ways to use, um, you know, if you have older students creating a prom party or playlist, if you have a, you know, football pep rally coming up, um, classroom playlist for mealtimes, morning arrival, um, you know, having the student of the week pick the playlist, whatever it might be. Um, Laura did a great job with these communication functions and vocabulary opportunities. Um, and I'm gonna, Laura is so passionate about this one, I'm gonna let her talk about this last slide. I mean, you guys get it. It's not about hitting the switch. It's about all the connection points that we have to communication, right? Whether you're annoying your siblings by playing Baby Shark for the 18th time. In our house this summer, it was, it's raining tacos. Oh. Do not look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about because it's an earworm that will be stuck in your head at 3 a.m. Illustrating a book, right? Like we are authors. We want them to have ownership and representation. We want them to be able to create these stories, change a song that we don't like. They don't want to hear the same song. They want that autonomy. They, it, so much is created when you have autonomy of your of your own world and your environment. Um, turning the pages of their own books and let them lead. It is so powerful if you let an alternative exercise come up to the classroom and lead the entire group in a, in a part of a lesson. Everyone's like, wow, the presumed potential and competence jumps sky high when you do things like that. It just leads by example. So just think about those things. Um, okay. I'll jump off my soapbox. Just know it's not about hitting the switch. It's about following their lead and following their interests to make the, both the curriculum and the communication engaging dynamic and making those connections. So, um, we gave you two blank slides so you can create your own for any opportunities that you want to create any lessons that you take back to camp, uh, for next time. And, um, I guess we can turn it over for questions and, oh, did you want to mention this? Yeah, this is the only thing I wanted to mention. If you are more of a PowerPoint user versus a Google slides user, I did do compare and contrast. Um, for example, when you're playing music videos, I need to kind of um, beat this up a little bit. You have to hit twice to advance slide on Google Slides versus PowerPoint. It only takes one click. Um, you can use two switches to play automatically forward and backward in PowerPoint. In Google Slides, I've not found a workaround for that yet. So this is just a nice kind of compare and contrast. This is more for video play um, and sound play, but just so you all have that. I think personally PowerPoint has more formatting opportunities and options, but I know is that schools really run on Google sometimes, so. All right, we, I think Laura, like you said, are here for questions. We know we are at an hour on the dot, but we are um, here, we have our references here. Uh, as well as image credit throughout the presentation with switches and mounting. All of our contact information is down here. Laura and I are um, happy to answer a question if you have one about a specific idea or option you saw today, or if you're like, we have this tool, how can we use it? Um, and yeah, I think we're just ready for questions if you guys have any. Um, I'll look at a few of those questions. We have Kaylee asked, do we need to request permission to use your core Google slide deck? You do not. You have uh, full access to it. You just make a copy and then um, all, you should have access to all of them. You can make a copy and then personalize them yourself. Like Laura did an awesome job. Um, she posted them on her Instagram too, where she turned all of my Google books into gestalts. Um, and potentially, like, again, it's just like giving opportunity and there's way more to that whole discussion about gestalts, but like making them a little bit more accessible. So yeah, that's why I think Mary Catherine's so generous with everything that she does as far as uploading. So if you need to 
attri uh, attribution is always nice, but it's not like feel free to adapt into what you need. Where to get the slides? Claire, can you um, take some of those housekeeping things? Yes, sorry, I got kicked out of Zoom. <laughs> oh no, welcome um, back. <laughs> yes, okay, so are we finished with all of our questions and everything? We think I think just, they wanna know um, a couple questions about can they get the recording and where they can get the slides and resources. Yes, so this recording will be uploaded on our Able You YouTube page, which I put in the chat a few minutes ago, um, but it will be uploaded later this afternoon, so you will have access to it then. Um, you can also, um, access that through our AbleU webpage on AbleNet's website. And then um, as far as the assessment um, has been put in the chat, and then when this webinar ends, you'll be redirected to the assessment page where you can take the assessment to get ASHA CEUs. Um, I've also put the handout, which has the links to everything that you've seen today in the chat, as well as the Zoom email, the handout link is in there as well. Um, so thank you everybody for attending and thank you to Mary Catherine and Laura. And but, hey, can I do, Blair, can I do one more answer? Do we have time yes. for that? Yes. So I think Beth had asked it a couple of times and we have talked about it in our other presentation, but I think sometimes people have a hard time differentiating how to go back and forth between these communication opportunities and the actual accessibility piece itself. So you, you have to differentiate, like, what does the language system look like for your user in that in that situation, right? Are they, is, are they connected to a robust voice output device, a speech generating device, or are they, are they using some adapted seating in that moment and you're doing partner assisted scanning? So what I would do is I would, again, just differentiate of what does my setup look like? How am I going back and forth between their AAC supports? And then how, how, how are they accessing the activity? Anything you would add, Mary Catherine? Yeah. I, and I think too, um, are you, and I don't know, Beth, if this is what you're talking about, are you accessing the Google Slides on their high-tech robust device? Then I do think it would be really tricky to go back and forth. So when I was doing this with a teen, he had his high-tech device, um, and then I had a separate computer. We were using a computer, so I had a second like Surface Pro I was using with him. I think toggling would be too much, uh, in my opinion, and not for... Um, every student, but um, I just thought in that moment, I really wanted that authentic, like, you know, opportunity with the flip book versus whatever it might be. Great, that's, uh, she said that makes that, sense. So that's, that makes sense. sense. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I always try to do two different systems if possible. Because again, we didn't talk about this, but it really makes sense in the sense that like, we want our language, if our access needs are high, we want our language needs to be low and vice versa. So if our language needs are high, in a lot of these situations they are, we want our access needs to yeah. be low. And maybe it's a different access method than what they, you know, maybe it's partner assisted scanning when they are using switch access to read a story or whatever it might be. Beth, you got more than what you probably ever wanted, sorry. Great. Well, if that's the end of our questions, like I said, this will be, will be redirected to the ASHA CEU assessment once this webinar ends. And thank you all for attending. And we hope you'll join us for another ABLU session again soon. Awesome. Thank you all so much. We'll Thanks stick so around much. just in case, but... Laura, there's a question about the CEU. Did you get that one? I saw that one come through. I was going to let Blair talk. Oh, I sorry. That. I meant Bam. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, get on that, Laura. Uh, you know. You got enough going on. <laughs> it's a little busy. Although, you know, I could make a Canva pre uh, certificate. <laughs> <laughs> Well, another question about able you providing trial switch devices. Lots of good questions today. And I always like it when they make me think, like, how would I do, you know, like, okay, yes. How would I get jump from if I need to go to C, yep. A to B to.
And as predicted, I knew we would have to fly. I know. Even though, even though I was like, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to have so much. We're going to have diving examples. And then time flies. We did have 144 slides, right? <laughs> oh, so just so you know, Mary Catherine says your slide decks appear to be view only. Oh. Copy attempt. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump off here and go, at Kaylee, which ones are they? I think it's, she's saying every single one. Every single one. Oh, you tried, tried stop and go. Okay. Um, Kaylee, um, they allowed me to download into, sorry, I'm trying to catch up, PowerPoint when I looked at the link for go from the website link. Okay. okay. And then you're, and then just re-upload. That makes sense. Yeah. You would um, just need to, you would need to, I think, so it is probably, Mm. I would think that it would make the most sense to be able to view and download because the only other way is if you give editing access and then if Which someone yeah. edits the original copy, then it can mess everything up, including the audio. But yeah, Kaylee, just download them and then re-upload them on your Google Drive and you should be able to edit away. Hopefully it doesn't mess with the formatting. I would say reach out if it does. Yeah, it definitely message me. I know you have access to them, um, but yeah, the downloading part. I just guess I always make a copy, but you're not saying that doesn't work. You can, I think you can only make a copy if you have editing access. Got it. Think. Okay, so then download. Got it. Think. Oh, but maybe it's a separate setting. You could look at that. I'll mess with that after. Okay, I'm going to jump off if no one else has questions. Me too. Hey, Bye. Bailey, do you need anything else? Bye. Uh, hey, thanks for, oh, hi, thanks for the presentation today. No, that's okay, Blair. Blair, uh, oh, Blair. Uh, why am I keep calling you Bailey? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> not a problem. No. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, just a reminder, please make sure to complete that assessment. That information will come in that follow-up email 24 hours from now, tomorrow as well. So you'll also have that link there. Um, if there are no more questions, thank you again for attending. And Mary, Catherine, and uh, uh, Laura, thank you very much for present presenting for us again. Thanks, Jim. Everyone have a great day. Yeah, happy oh, spring. You too.